Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Araminta Show. Hello everyone, welcome to a new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia and I'm here with Aaron Meta from the Aaron Meta Show. Hey, how's it going? So a few days ago, Nintendo celebrated their 130th anniversary and we discussed about it briefly on the Aaron Meta Show. So uh, a while back, uh, the Game Boy celebrated its 30th anniversary and I kind of did like a little April Fool's Day joke on it when I was originally supposed to post something for all that month. So I decided, you know what, it's about time that I actually did talk about the Game Boy. So uh, what are your early histories with the Game Boy, Aaron? Oh my goodness, like uh, this... uh... I think for me, like, I think it took a little bit of a while to catch him, but my goodness, when it caught on, it caught on like wildfire. I think probably for me, like, uh, the original Game Boy, obviously it was, uh, when you first looked at it, it was this um, this big gray box with, like, this uh, green screen on it, and I had, like, all these you know, very small little pixels on it, and so you had basically what was a kind of smaller, cruder version of the, the Nintendo Entertainment System at the time. And, uh, but, you know, like uh, Super Mario Land and uh, Tetris and uh, all the and also Link's Awakening as well, which was probably the uh, the biggest thing to ever hit Game Boy, I think, uh, probably until Pokemon at the time. I think, you know, all these games that came out for it were incredible. You know, like, uh, even though it was just like a small little thing that, uh, and it was, uh, you know, it wasn't as great as like some of the other uh, consoles that came out. I mean, keep this in mind. Uh, you know, Game Boy uh, outlasted the Nintendo Entertainment System, outlasted the Super Nintendo, outlasted the Nintendo 64, and only retired the minute GameCube hit the scene. And so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this, this thing, this thing was a challenger in the in the gaming market, and uh, so you know, it's um, for us like uh, this even went to many generations of people. Uh, this console, so I think it has. A lot of warm memories for me has a lot of experiences for me as well. And, uh, you know, and there's going to be different ones that we're going to talk about throughout this entire podcast. Yeah, for sure. Um, what was your first Game Boy game, do you recall? Super Mario Land. Yeah, yeah, I would say the same thing for me, too. So, yeah, I got my Game Boy like around the mid 90s, I would say. The early 90s was definitely a time in which when um, the, the very first handheld I ever had was a Tiger Electronics handheld. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so Tiger Electronics, I mean, 
I can understand what they were going for, but uh, I mean, just like uh, the fact that you only had like one game encased in this giant plastic thing. Like, I mean, it was okay for like five minutes, but then after that, like, uh, you know, you you walked away from it pretty quickly after that. Did something else, you know? It was just <laughs> it, it was there to fill time, basically, yeah. when you had no other time to fill. And uh, which is it, unfortunate, really, because, you know, you know, now that you look back at them, it's like they're a massive waste of plastics. They must be like in landfill somewhere, just filling up just like, you know, all these old, you know, retired machines. And uh, like, uh, you, I don't think you can even re- I don't think you can even recycle that stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, yeah, that's a really good point. It's like, you know, where are the remaining tiger handhelds? Are they like in a in, in a dump somewhere buried alongside with the Atari 2600 um, uh, cartridges of E.T.? Yeah, I mean, that I, makes you wonder. At least when they found those games, at least it looked like they were like kind of like degrading at some point. I don't know. Looking at those tiger, looking how bulky the, like how heavily plastically built those things were. I'd be very surprised if those things will like degrade at any point. You know, that won't be yeah, a that's, thousand yeah, years very from true. now. You know, like it's just a, uh, you know, like here's the thing about this. I wouldn't say I would not lambast the tiger games if they were if they had some kind of like last ability. You know, here's the thing with the Game Boy, and this is the thing about. Uh, the Tiger um, electronic games. I mean, obviously, there's going to be loads and loads of pros, and compared to, you know, and they will not stand up against the cons of the Tiger electronic games. But uh, I mean, imagine if instead Tiger had created the Tiger electronic handheld as, uh, you know, let's say for example, like the LCD and the actual chipboard, like the actual thing was an actual cartridge. So you would just take that bit out of it, and then you'd put in another one. You can play like you know a different game. You know, imagine if the games were actually interchangeable with the uh, the Tiger Electronic handheld. Maybe it probably would have stood somewhat of a chance against what was eventually going to come of what we're going to talk about now, which is the Game Boy. And so, yeah, well, I, don't, for, that... don't forget, Aaron, they did have something like that. It was called the Gamecom. Yeah, but the Gamecom was terrible. Like, you know, like I, I, I give it points for like, being the first you know, a stylus pen, get, you know, thing. But uh, the problem is, is that it's like uh, you, uh, it had like a modem port which you could connect to it, but you, 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 you couldn't like take it anywhere and it wasn't wireless, none either. So like, you know, like no. it had a load of it, you know, the Gamecom, you know, took the impracticalities, I think, of having uh, this, this get, having a game system, we kind of ramped them up big time, you know? So it was like, uh, you know, the, there was, the Gamecom was, uh, not at least in my opinion, a worthy challenger to the Game Boy in any sense, and on top of that as well, I think he had like a pretty hefty price tag as well, from what I gather. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's one of the things that are that is a huge advantage over the Game Boy. Even though that when the Sega Game Gear and the Atari Lynx came out, and it did feature a lot more advances to the Game Boy, like actually showing color, and it actually had. Um, you know, like a sturdability that, you know, at the time they were saying like, you know, look at the width and the thickness of our of our handheld. It can be able to be a lot more sturdier than the Game Boy, which is kind of ironic because if you remember um, from the from Nintendo Power that um, uh, somebody brought their Game Boy uh, alongside with them during the Gulf War. And then when, you know, there was a huge explosion, the Game Boy was able to survive. And I actually saw it when I was at the Museum of um, Modern Art or MoMA, uh, Mo- you yeah, know, Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, MoMA is what it's called. And um, they actually did have this um, exhibit called 100 Years of Toys. And the Game Boy was a part of it. And it was like put in this plastic um, display where you got to see the burnt Game Boy and it was showing off a screen of Tetris meant that it was still working. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, this is the thing I loved about Nintendo consoles as well, is that uh, they made them so that they were durable. You know, like uh, even the GameCube, even with a spinning disc inside it, you know, like I remember one time that I dropped my GameCube, you know, you actually fell off the table or something like that. It was still working. You mm-hmm. know, like, you know, it's like, uh, this is the thing. Like uh, a lot of what Nintendo build, you know, are, are set to last the test of time. The only time I actually kind of probably was a bit critical now of nin- of Nintendo in regards to their build design would probably be the Nintendo Switch because, like, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's a tablet that would require, you know, you purchasing a, you know, a, a, a you know, a one of those screens to put it on to, uh, like, uh, protect it from, like, getting shattered or anything like that. You know, like, uh, it's like, I think the only thing that Nintendo ever produced until now was, uh, you know, something that was, like, you know, not very... You know, very good to shock was probably, you know, uh, the Nintendo Switch. But, uh, you know, we, we, you know, in all the library 
that you see of Nintendo that they that they produced, at least there's some durability to their gaming devices because they knew that you know things were going to get dropped. They knew that things were going to get knocked around and stuff like that. And so you know the Game Boy also had those uh, had the massive amounts of durability put into it. So you could drop it on the floor or you know you could fall down the stairs or something like that, and it was you know you still pick it up and it would still work. You know, yeah, okay. So the LCD screen would probably still you know be pliable to uh, to destruction, but uh, at least the rest of the console would be fine. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that for the most part, when I got my Game Boy and it came alongside with um, Tetris and then eventually I got Super Mario Land for either my birthday or for Christmas. And then after a while, um, you know, I started getting some other like, you know, one off games. And then eventually I got a Game Boy Color. And then that's when Pokemon started coming out. And when Pokemon hit when I was in middle school, oh, man, I mean, I cannot tell you how many times. Um, you know, people will be talking about Pokemon and then around breakfast and lunch times, they will be getting out their Game Boys with their link cables and either battling or trading Pokemon that they didn't have. Oh, you know, when uh, when uh, Pokemon hit the scene, like, you know, that was that was it, you know, like uh, there was no I mean, I don't think what, what other games came out during that craze, you know, like uh, when you really think about it. Yeah, there was probably like, you know, the. Uh, occasional Zelda games you know it actually makes me want to make sure to wonder now actually to bring out a little list of uh, Game Boy games just to see what on earth uh, else was kind of there at the time because you know you you when you fell into Pokemon like uh, there was nothing else you know like uh, it was uh, just uh, you know Pokemon pretty much ruled the roost there was the cartoon show there was the um there w- there was uh, you know the cards as well like uh, I know originally I think it started off as a as a card game originally um, yeah, it, yeah well I mean actually it started off as the 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 game for the um the Game Boy then yeah. it spun off into the cards then we had the TV show uh uh-huh, so yeah so like you know Pokemon was what was the was the phenomenon that so nearly there I say kind of like you know it gets to the point where like the Game Boy it kind of just ended up kind of like being the thing that it kind of got played on really until you know other consoles started picking up the pokemon craze too so you know if anything it almost dare i say i think the the craze almost kind of eclipsed nearly eclipsed the game boy itself in a way yeah you know, happens like, oh well you know oh and you get into the pokemon craze oh wait i need to buy a game boy okay then well that's no problem so i'll buy a game boy and i'll get into the pokemon craze you know so it was uh... yeah yeah exactly and you have to think at this point like it was 1998 that we got it in japan because um i mean in america in america we got it in 1998 in japan it was released in 1996 so the game boy was 10 years old at that point and um you know it, it, basically the um, game boy had like little to no variety even though that there were talks of releasing a brand new game boy around the late 90s that was you know, called Project Atlantis, and it was going to have, like, Super Nintendo-like graphics. We wouldn't get that until, like, at least around the um, 2003, uh, or, 2000, no, 2001. So it was about another, like, three years later. Yeah, the, actually, so that, I'll tell you what, I will, uh, I, I've actually just got the list up now of, like, everything that came out after Pokemon Yellow. And uh, so let me give you a rundown of uh, some of the things that came out of that time. Uh, Pocket Golf, um, mm-hmm. Yu-Gi-Oh! Jewel Monsters, and then pretty much nothing after that. You know, like, uh, that was... Uh, I mean, not necessarily true. We had Shantae. Yeah, like, uh, so, uh, I mean, like, uh, I'm just trying to look. I was at least in the Japanese section of uh, games that came out. But uh, besides that, I mean, like, uh, Pokemon Yellow, I mean, we pretty much uh, pretty much ruled the scene, pretty much, mm-hmm. uh, after that. And so, and by the time, also on top of that as well, by, by that time, you know, Game Boy Color was starting to become a thing as well. So, like, uh, that was another thing that also kind of, like... Uh, brought uh, the Game Boy itself kind of like into uh, it was you can see it was nearing its end at that time. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean I mean just like you were mentioning Aaron that the Game Boy outlived the NES, the SNES, the Nintendo 64 and then it stopped when GameCube was just starting to become more popular. So uh-huh. it it lasted for close to 15 years. Mm-hmm. So and you and we already know about the story about Nintendo struggling to create a new handheld and then eventually they release it around roughly the same time as the GameCube to kind of kick off the new generation, the Game Boy Advance and the Game Boy and the GameCube. So yeah, I mean can you imagine like um with everything else that came out with handheld wise that Nintendo was able to dominate everything. It was able to defeat the Sega Game Gear and the Atari Lynx, then the Tiger Game Com and you know, pretty much um, like little things here and there. Uh, it dominated all of it, and um, 
and you have to understand that we're talking about like with the Game Boy, like the original brick, and then eventually when it reached over to Pocket and Color, and then finally we got the GBA. But still, I mean, that's pretty impressive for um, you know a, a, t- a console, a handheld console like that, to endure the test of time, even though it was incredibly limited back then. Yeah, well, there is one thing we need to thank for, though, in regards to like the original Game Boy. You know what that is? What is that? The legacy of the Game and Watch. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I'm sure that some people already know about the Game and Watch um, created around the um, early '80s, and it had games that feature Mr. Game and Watch. I'm sure you, you probably already know about, you know, with Super Smash Brothers, but. Uh, you know, he used to play like a bunch of like mini games and you could also play Mario Brothers and Donkey Kong in the game of watch. And yeah, that was kind of like their first foray into handhelds. That's where the D-pad originally uh, originally came from. So, yeah, I mean, without the basis of that and, um, you know, we wouldn't have the Game Boy. And from what I remember in an, um, a video from Digino you know Gaming, Gunpo Yokoi around 1979 when he was traveling uh, in a train, he saw a guy who was so bored and he started like punching buttons in his calculator to pass the time. And he thought, you know, that'd be fun. And so that would basically be the idea for the Game & Watch. And then eventually the Game Boy kind of like, um, you know, followed through. Okay, then I, re- I, uh, I, re- I try what I say. It was the calculator that was what we got for, like, for the Game for the game Watch and the Game Boy. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, the calculators, but uh, yes. nah, seriously. But, uh, um, so, you know, it's surprising, though, because, you know, it wasn't, you know, game, Mr. Game & Watch didn't become a thing until Smash Brothers. And uh, you would have thought that, uh, given that this, uh, you know, the Game Boy was kind of based on the legacy of the, of the Game & Watch, you would have thought he would have become somewhat of a prevalent character. In, yeah. in the game in the Game Boy library, but he never did. Yeah, exactly. And and, and some people may argue about, oh, um, you know, he was a character from like the early '80s. Nobody would have remembered him. Well, what about Pac Man? What about the Duck Hunt Dog? What about Donkey Kong? Those characters came out around the early '80s, and people still remember them. Mario, guess... who's he? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I, it, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's like um, you know, not a lot of people actually bring up the Game & Watch when discussing about Nintendo handhelds. I guess the Game Boy must have overshadowed it so much that the only reason why people still remembered it was either in Super Smash Brothers or when um, that one time that they tried to bring Game & Watch games into the Game Boy Advance using, um, you know, uh, the, that peripheral that nobody seemed to like, where you had to collect cards and scan it so you could be able to play stuff in it. Uh, that they only did it one time in E3 2000, I think it was 2003 or 2004 or something. And then they decided, no, nah, we're not going to do it anymore. So, yeah, the only time in which Game & Watch really became more mainstream to the public was in Smash Brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, in regards to retro games coming up on the Game Boy, I mean, Space Invaders was also uh, one game that also, uh, you could get on the Game Boy too. Yeah, Arkanoid as well. Uh, Arkanoid also was another one, and uh, also uh, trying to think of a few other ones that also made their way onto there. Uh, nothing comes to mind as yeah. Oh, Balloon Kid also was on there too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, there was a lot of uh, NES um, ports that went over to the Game Boy, and um, you know some people may argue that oh, you know it just made the you know game kind of more limited and less fun to play with as opposed to if you were playing on a console. But if you were on the go, then, you know, that was the game to play. Um, you know, that was that was the console that you would bring along with you. I mean, you know, this was like back then in which you couldn't like install a TV into your car or to your SUV. Uh, the Game Boy was the only way of um, activity that you could play with on the go if you wanted to catch up with like Mario or Zelda or anything like that. Yeah, and also uh, the Game Boy also gave us uh, one unique character that uh, obviously uh, was uh, a alternative uh, enemy to uh, Mario, and that was Wario. Yeah, exactly. So that was uh, in uh, Super Mario Land Two, six golden coins. We are, we actually did get to see Wario as an enemy, and then in the third game, that was when the Wario Land series started, and he started becoming his own character. And then Wario pretty much took over, like, you know, all the party games around the Game Boy Advance and the, the DS and all that stuff. Uh, I know I'm not one to make production requests on this show, but uh, could you stick in, like, the uh, the uh, Mario 2 uh, advertisement for, uh, you know, showing uh, Wario and, like, uh, you know, hypnotizing the audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll put that in. Oh, 
obey me, Wario. I am your master. Mario is your enemy. The wicked imposter Wario has cast an evil spell over Mario Land. Don't let Mario get the six golden coins. Don't let Mario reach the palace. This is the biggest, most dangerous, most challenging Game Boy adventure yet. Obey Wario. Destroy Mario. Don't fall under Wario's evil spell in Super Mario Land 2. Only on Game Boy. <laughs> Beware, Wario. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, 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 that's actually how I first got introduced to Wario, just by seeing that commercial. It's like, who is this guy? And this would be, bef- this would be like years before I would actually play uh, Super um, Mario Land 3 Wario Land, because I actually know about the first two games, but I hadn't played the third one until much later on. So I was actually first introduced to Wario when they were talking about like the Wario Land games on the Game Boy Advance. And... Uh, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, you started, like, and then there was, like, also um, a Wario Land game on the GameCube as well. And then they had one on the Wii, Wario Land Shake It. Yeah. Which there, was also, actually, there, was also, there was also, there was the one that uh, made, totally made no sense, and that was the Wario Land that appeared on the Virtual Boy as well. And it's supposed to be, like, the, the best Virtual Boy game. But unfortunately, the thing is, is that it's actually not uh, uh, based, it actually should not have actually been on the Virtual Boy in the first place. It should have just been, like, a regular Nintendo game. Yeah, that's true. I have mixed opinions about the Virtual Boy. I understand what they were trying to do. They were trying to kind of give the Game Boy a rest, and they were trying to do something brand new like virtual reality. And, uh, you know, they were trying to also prolong the Nintendo 64 because, you know, it was taking a long time for them to do. I guess the PlayStation didn't exactly help much for them. So, yeah, the Virtual Boy was a failure, and uh, but at least um, you know virtual reality on consoles now are much better, especially with um, the stuff on the Switch. You know where you got to use like the Labo and you got to like make the little virtual reality glasses and play you know games like Doom and such. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, as long as some of the other Game Boy games that were on here as well, Donkey Kong, even the original Donkey Kong was also uh, a feature in uh, Game Boy as well, and it also appears in uh, various top ten. Uh, countdowns of uh, people who uh, want to reminisce about the Game Boy 2. So. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about the um, Mario vs. Donkey Kong, right? Uh, no, actually, the original one actually did appear on the uh, on the on the Game Boy. So, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that yeah. was the one that came out in 1994. Mm-hmm. And also, we were introduced to Kirby, I believe, on the Dream. Bo- oh, sorry, on the uh, on the Game Boy as well. Yep, that's right. Uh, Kirby's Dream Land was a uh, Game Boy game first. Uh, back in 1992, which I actually did a Let's Play of a long time ago when I used to be a part of a Let's Play channel. And uh, yeah, that's actually where Kirby got his ga- debut. And, uh, you know, this was like before he had the copy abilities, which was featured in the NES uh, game Kirby's Adventure. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's kind of weird because like, he started off as white and then eventually became pink. You know? Yeah, there was like some sort of like marketing issues in America. So they decided to make him um, white for some reason because I guess that's how he looked like in the Game Boy game. I think in the Japanese version of Kirby's Dream Land, I think that they do have him in his correct color. I know that um, you know uh, that um, Sakurai and Miyamoto were arguing about what color he should be, whether he should be pink or yellow. But white was never one, that's for sure. It's just like it's, it's just kind of weird because like you know you look at that and he looks like you think that he look you think he was like from like Boo like one of the Boos from the haunted house in Mario, you know, like, yeah exactly. Oh, hey look, Boo's got his own game, you know, finally. <laughs> Way before yeah. Luigi's got Luigi's Mansion, at least the Boo from Super Mario got his own game. Like you know, it's just it's, uh, uh, but uh, you know, thankfully they came to the senses and turned in pink. So yeah, exactly, yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, with everybody joking about Kirby just being an adorable marshmallow, it's like this is literally an adorable marshmallow in a Game Boy. So, yeah, I guess the jokes never stop there. Um, Also, just notes as well, uh, you know, obviously TMNT was a big thing at that time. And naturally, Konami gave them their own game on the Game Boy, which was uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, Fall of the Foot Clan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There were a lot of TMNT games uh, on the Game Boy, like... Um, I, I mean, there's like so many of them that it, it's kind of hard to count. I guess they, you know, because there were a lot of game, uh, you know, NES games of TMNT as well. Like the uh, the first three were on the NES and then the fourth one was on the Super Nintendo. And then they had TMNT Tournament Fighter. The one thing I, I, I felt about the Game Boy, and uh, I know people are big fans of puzzle games. I'm not going to take away puzzle games. Puzzle games are 
fun of Ezekiel Tanzer. I don't know. Like when I felt like I got my Game Boy out, I felt like I wanted to go on an adventure. You know, like uh, I think because we had Super Mario Land, because we had Link's Awakening, and because we had, uh, you know, we had uh, we had Metroid Two. You know, uh, you know, with uh, as well. Like uh, I just felt like my Game Boy felt more a bit like you know a mini adventuring machine more than it did feel like a puzzle machine. You know? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I think that it's more the adults enjoy the puzzle games. I have heard so many stories about like, oh, you know, moms used to love playing Tetris and Dr. Mario so much that they would, you know, not give their kids their Game Boys back. So I can understand the appeal of like, you know, games like that because they're so easy to follow as opposed to like maybe for some adults like, you know, adventure games like, you know, Zelda or anything like that would be a little bit too complicated for them to understand. Mm-hmm. And uh, for those of you who do not know, also uh, the uh, classic Ducktales also got a uh, NES release. Sorry, got a uh, Game Boy release as well. So uh... yeah, it's basically very similar to um, what they did with both Ducktales and Ducktales Two. They actually did have some of the same platforms as well, and also the Mega Man games were also pl- um, ported into the Game Boy as well, except for Mega Man Five, in, in which they like changed the story completely and they had you know different robot masters mm-hmm. um the only thing i think about the the only negative thing i think we what we say about the game boy is probably the uh, just some inconsistencies with the uh with the with the design because you know it had like the most limited he basically had calculated technology kind of like built into it with the, you know it was a dog matrix machine but it required four double a batteries to uh basically power up and it would only do it power it up for like a couple of hours and then you need to change them out again so like uh, you know the uh, in a way the uh, the Game Boy kind of ended up you kind of like unless you have some like rechargeable battery stations or something like that they did eventually come out with those uh, type of third party peripherals but uh, I mean uh, about, you know you were spending quite a lot of money trying to replace AA batteries you know you have to also not only do you have to buy you know not one not two we had to like buy a, like a full pack of batteries to like keep this thing going and also on top of that as well if you took it on holiday for like a certain period of time you'd have to be you take like probably like uh, eight AA batteries with you. You know? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that, that was back in the day in which, you know, you kids nowadays with your chargeable 3DSs and switches that, you know, you don't have to worry about like going over to the store and buying your battery so that you could be able to play with your Game Boy. Yeah, I, I, I mean, no, but it's, you ever, um, you ever, like, you know, when you're like, you're like doing like an intense play. Like, so you ever felt like, you know, most of the time you're like you were playing up against the wall because you had to plug your Game Boy in basically in order to basically complete particular missions and games and things like that. It was yeah. Like, you felt like you were being punished in a way, like you know, you just go sit in the corner and you know complete this level, and so you know, don't come out until you're done. <laughs> you <know? So. laughs> yeah, it's like you know, what are you doing in the wall? I have to beat this level. Um, you don't have to sit there, you know. It's like I'm plugged into the wall. I must play, otherwise I'll lose my say state. Yeah, it's like you know, unless you had like an extension lead which like led up to your chair, you couldn't really like uh, you know, y- you were basically forced to kind of sit next to the wall to play your game in a way. And another thing too was the lighting. The lighting was really terrible. Well, I mean, this is the thing. Like, I don't think. I mean, Game Boy was kind of like meant to be kind of the thing that was. I think the way that they designed it was supposed to be, was supposed to be played during the day. And not during the night, and so which, uh, in a way, was kind of like a bit, a bit short-sighted, really, because you know, if you if you're in bed and you got you know nothing to do, like uh, you know, and you can't sleep, you know, uh, well, one thing you probably would like to do is probably play Game Boy, you know, and uh, probably you know, and uh, if you're not reading a book or anything like that, and so you know, that's when you know you had issues with like trying to adjust the lamp to make sure it's like he's not shining on your Game Boy and everything like that. So like, uh, yeah, play, playing Game Boy in bed was not the greatest thing to do, uh, in, in a way. Until you're like, uh, unless you've got the lighting just about right. And even then, it's like, you know, your parents just came up to your bedroom and just told you to go to bed anyway. So uh... Yeah, exactly. And, and also during car trips, I remember when um, I used to go on a lot of car trips with my mom and, uh, you know, to visit family members. And, you know, sometimes we'll be traveling like pretty late at night and, you know, I would try to play the Game Boy and the only light I was able to rely on were the street lights. And so every time that I see a little gif of a kid playing Pokemon on, you know, inside the car while the a bit of light from the street light was able to just shine in for just a few extra seconds, I totally related to that a lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, they actually did. Well, this was a good thing for like, uh, you know, third parties to kind of bring in because, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a whole economy is kind of like built up around Game Boy. As well, like uh, you know, you had uh, you know companies developing like backlights. You had companies uh, developing you know batteries for extra um, extra battery storage. You know, you had uh, 
you know, companies developing like, you know, uh, encasings to like hold Game Boy games more. And uh, then you had, uh, funny enough, like, I never understood the ones that made the Game Boy louder. I never really understood those peripherals. Like, why? Yeah, would... I mean, what, what's wrong with headphones, you know? Yeah, but I, yeah, I just never understood that why you would want to have something like that. And if you're playing in an if like if you're like I mean, there's some people like argue like oh, it's for like if you're like in a really noisy area. Let me safely say this: if you're in an area that's noisier than your Game Boy, I would suggest you you know put some ha- ear- earphones on because you know your whatever's you whatever's uh, creating all the noise outside of the Game Boy can't be good for your hearing. So yeah, and also and some people might argue, oh, what if you're surrounded by a group of friends and you're playing the game and they can't hear what's going on? Well, I mean, they would mostly want to see the game, not hear it. Mostly, yeah. Well, we're becoming kind of more bothering the friends. Really trying to, we're trying to have a conversation here. Can we turn your Game Boy down, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much so. Um, but yeah, I, I never really understood those. Like the lighting, I get, but the sound, I don't really understand. So, oh. do you yeah. remember the custom control ones as well? Like uh, the ones that turned like the D pad into a thumbstick, and like uh, for the other ones, I kind of like made the A and B buttons bigger. I never really. Yeah, uh, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah they, they used to be worse than actually the uh, having the actual controllers. Like you know, you don't just kind of like, yeah, oh well, this this sucks, you know. Like uh, here I am playing this thumbstick, and I thought it was going to make the game more controllable, but instead it's just basically just uh, you know doing what I'm doing now, except it's just giving me like another, it's taking me like a half an inch off my uh, off my D-pad, you know. So yeah, like, yeah, I, I remember those because they used to sell them in like the um, you know like those toy stores that not they're not like Toys R Us or anything like that, but kind of like the off-brand toy stores where they used to sell like the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, uh, all the games, and then they would have like this little corner where they would used to sell like these weird peripherals. That's actually how I got my um, little um, Game Boy Light, you know, that little um, lamp thing with like the curly um, cord on it. That's actually where I got. It, but all the other ones just looked really weird like um yeah you're, you're mentioning about the buttons like i guess maybe they thought that oh you know maybe for a grown-up maybe they think that the buttons are too small but no that just made it like really hard to press and also what's the point of having the analog stick on a game boy when there's it, it only moves in like four directions anyway yeah, I never really saw what the benefits of that were going to be. Or actually, there's not only that as well, not just the thumbsticks, but they even made like a proper joysticks as well. Like, you know, so the joy, so you'd have to like uh, put your phone on top of a joystick and move that around. And yeah, I remember having, uh, trying out one of those one part, one point. I, I, I swear, my, my, my uh, knuckle that, uh, you know, it, when I was moving my, moving that around, I could hear it clicking like multiple times as I was doing it. It's like, this can't be good for my thumb. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, know, I'm gonna I'm gonna feel that in later life, you know. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, another thing that I really did appreciate about the Game Boy was that um, not only like the variety of games that it had, but also like I mentioned before about when I was playing Pokemon during my middle school years, that it was there was like a sense of community there. Like if you knew somebody who had this particular game and you never played it, then you got to try it out during breakfast time or lunch time and. Then you get to like talk about it. You know, Nintendo Power was still popular, so people like I knew this one kid. <clears throat> excuse me, I know this one kid who actually had Nintendo Power, and he would bring it, and we would kind of like sneakily like read it during breakfast time. You know, when the adults didn't allow that, they just said, you know, eat your breakfast, and then you know we had to go to class. So we would always be like reading up on some like really um, interesting news, like. Um, you know, any new games that are going to be out, and then like the top 10 or top 25 best games on the Game Boy. And, you know, depending on what year it came out, uh, you know, they would always be talking about like, um, you know, Link's Awakening or Wario Land or um, let's see, there was also um, Final Fantasy Adventure. And um, then eventually when Pokemon hit, I mean, Pokemon, like it stood in the top three for like many years, like with um, red, blue, yellow, then eventually gold and silver. And um, then eventually that was when it was ported over to the Game Boy Advance and then we had Ruby and Sapphire, but that's beside the point. Mm. But yeah, um, Again, I think that- Pokemon rules the roost, pretty much like it was that, it was the phenomenon of our time. And uh, you know, there's a reason why we bring it up multiple times is because you know, it was, uh, you had to see it to believe it. You know, like uh, if, uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people here and they're like in their thirties and probably going into their, you know, always going into their 30s, who will understand that time, you know, like when 
um, you know, the cartoon series was on, you were like, you were playing your Game Boy and you had the link cables in as well. And uh, that, uh, you know, it was becoming that thing. And uh, but mind you, just, just thinking with the link cables for a second, do you know, do you know, there was actually like a four way link cable you could play four Game Boys with? Yeah, I would see it in the toy stores a couple of times, but I didn't know any games you can play that with. Yeah, like, I don't know any games either, and uh, yeah, let her, let her know. Like, I've never, I mean, I know one person who did buy it, but i never seen him use it at all. Like, you know, yeah. it was, like, it was uh, I guess, you know, it was at the point, I mean, to be fair, when people bought those things, like, you know, th- there was an expectation, because everyone at that time, you know, when that got released, you know, you know, keep this in mind, like, millions of these things were flying off the shelves, but I mean, pretty much you, you knew somebody who owned one, and even, you know, me and Patricia became uh, owners ourselves, like, uh, you know, we're, eventually you knew someone who was going to own a Game Boy, so, you know, when you see all these far-out wacky accessories, you know, like, you know, it wouldn't be that we're going to, like, feature uh, multiple ability to, for connectivity so of course we, you know people were going to end up buying them so uh, people are, you know say what were you thinking buying that but when you're in an environment where you know at least you know at least three maybe four maybe even five people who own these machines you know of course you're going to buy something like that aren't you so yeah exactly you're going to buy some weird peripheral that um kind of made sense at the time but is kind of useless now yeah, I think probably the worst Game Boy peripheral I think I ever bought was probably the link cable that goes to. Uh, so there's this uh, game. I mean, we're, we're skipping back a bit ahead here, but uh, there's actually a game, a link cable you can actually buy for the Nintendo GameCube to link the Game Boy up to there. And uh, the only thing I really did it for is because it, when you play Star Wars Rogue Squadron, you can actually link it up to. Uh, uh, it actually talks to the Game Boy and actually gives you extra, extra like uh, controller abilities. Uh, so you can like command your units around, and you can also like do other things as well, and, like control R two D two, and like for like repairs and things like that. So you mean that that was what I bought it for for that particular thing. But in regards to like anything else, I never really owned another GameCube game, at least uh, I don't think so, that actually utilized that cable. So really, all I did was buy it for uh, for for one game, and eventually it was one I game I traded eventually. So uh, yeah, like uh, that's probably still in a box somewhere, you know, with a whole bunch of other cables which. Uh, I know I'm never going to need again, but uh, you know it was uh, that was pretty, so, well. Some Game Boy accessories were were quite fascinating, and uh, you know you really wanted to own them. And uh, you know there's actually one accessory actually that we need to talk about later on in the show. But uh, um, you know in regards to like some of the useless ones that were out there, there were a lot of them. And, yeah, uh, they were. And everyone wanted to take advantage of the Game Boy craze. Yeah, they did, and I, I think that um, you know the Game Gear and the Lynx also kind of wanted to take advantage of it as well. When they saw the um, the durability that the Game Boy had, they tried to do some new things, like, "Hey, look, we got color. Look, we got this blast processing. Look, we have this game exclusive, and you'll not get it anywhere else." Uh, I remember, like, all, all these days for Game for Game Gear fans, I never met a happy Game Gear owner. I'm I'm serious. Like you know, I I know some people who like bought the Game Gear thinking it was going to be as good as the uh, uh, either as a Master System or as the Genesis. And uh, but uh, you know, when they when they finally got hold of it and they saw the games that were available for it, they were pretty disappointed, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, even the Sonic games weren't even that good. No, yeah, like Sonic. Uh, what was their main Sonic game on there? Like it was like even slower than the than the ones that uh, you know, even it was even slower than the Sonic Pinball and Sonic 3D. <laughs> Yeah, like Sonic Labyrinth. Oh, yeah. Sonic oh, Labyrinth was terrible. Mm-hmm. You know, when you, just when you thought Sega couldn't get any worse, they brought out that piece of shit, you know? Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, I, I, and also the Lynx. I mean, it didn't really have a lot of third-party support. This was when Atari was kind of, like, reaching its low point right before the the masterpiece, that is, the Jaguar, kind of, like, killed them off. And then it wouldn't. It's really t- weird. The, uh, the fact that Atari decided to do its rebranding, but decided to do it with like their first handheld console. Like you know, you would have thought to kind of get the craze going and get people kind of like you know get people's mouths watering. You would have thought they would have brought out a console that was named after their cats. You know, because it yeah, was yeah. the first console to be not named after a number. And so, for I think for a lot of Atari, at least at least the existing Atari audience, I think it was kind of a bit of a weird concept, really saying, "Oh, hey, we're going to name it something completely different, and it's going to be a handheld console." You know, it's like yeah. uh, it's almost kind of yeah, like their, it's kind of like their version of like when uh, Bethesda came over and said, "Oh, we're going to release, uh, you know, a Diablo for the for the mobile phone." You know, it's like uh, that, that, oh, oh, what's the matter? Don't you have phones? 
<laughs> like it's just it was uh, for them it was like it was kind of a bit of a shell shock really I think for them because what this thing fits in my hand and it's not it's in its Atari console it's not named after a number like uh, I think that just didn't compute all, all well with Atari fans I don't think yeah not only that but you couldn't even put it into your pocket I mean sure the original Game Boy you couldn't really do that either unless you had like a big pocket in your pants but even with the Game Boy um, you know pocket and the Game Boy Color you could so that and you know even there was not even like a smaller version of the um, the Game Gear or even the Lynx that you could be able to like take it on the go I mean you had to get like a special case so you could be able to carry it around I know like, I think it was at the time because uh, you know at least people that I knew they Everyone was carrying around rucksacks and like you were carrying around like just like you know just carrying around bags but you know not everyone carried bags like you know if you weren't gonna you know if you're on a family night out you know you're gonna take your bag with you were you like you know it's like maybe you'll say maybe maybe you'll take your purse with you maybe maybe it's a maybe it's an, an oversized accessory for your purse i don't know like you know maybe it was a maybe it was a, a, a con maybe these consoles were aimed at the female audience who knows but uh, I mean, like uh, in regards to like carrying these things, like uh, you know, uh, you, yeah, exactly. You weren't going to carry them around in your pocket. You weren't going to carry them around, you know, um, just genuinely. You know, uh, you know, they they in order to basically to make it outside the house. If you're like going like on a on a family like dinner, dinner to the restaurant or something like that, or if you're going to go catch a movie or something like that, likelihood is you probably weren't going to take your bag with you. Likely you're only going to take yourself and whatever you can carry in your pockets. And, you know, the Atari Lynx and the Game Gear were not two of those things. Maybe the Game Boy, you know, even, even the bulky design, maybe you could get away with. And, you know, definitely when uh, Nintendo went for the Game Boy Pocket, oh, yeah, everyone I knew were taking those things around with you. And mm -hmm. uh, it, only, it, only just, it only just kind of, like, maximized when uh, uh, Game Boy went as far as the uh, the Game Boy SP. You know, like, uh, it's just, uh, so the, ga the Game Boy, you know, throughout years was just, uh, had this great reputation of just being this console, which you could take uh, where wherever you wanted with you. And you could keep it, it just it's in your pocket whenever you needed to. You know, like, uh, while other game consoles couldn't really do that. And, uh, you know, the only gaming devices, I think, that could actually, you know, rival the Game Boy, at least, you know, taking in, taking it around in your hands was probably, you know, the Apple phone or, you know, uh, an Android phone. You know, those, those are the only devices that really rival the Game Boy, I think, in today's world. Yeah, pretty much. And I think that um, maybe, you know, despite all of that, I think that's why that the Game Boy has, um, you know, endured all these years. And um, even, like, after... I mean, to, to be, you know, admittedly that, you know, technology has gotten a lot better and, you know, stuff like the Game Boy Advance and the DS and 3DS and eventually the Switch had definitely, you know, brought um, portable gaming much more easier for people to, you know, play around and also had a lot more in the library of like really good quality games. You know, we cannot forget about what the Game Boy did in, you know, its early run and, you know, how much it influenced a lot of people's, you know, memories. Mm -hmm. so yeah i think that um you know i think we you know pretty much talked about everything i mean you know we can briefly talk about some of our favorite game boy games like you know obviously like the super mario land series uh you know kirby's dreamland um you know link's awakening uh well, there's, let's... there's a lot of things we haven't touched upon yet and uh there's one there's actually there's one gaming accessory actually we haven't talked about yet oh it's, oh i'm sorry what's that the game boy camera Oh, yeah. Yeah. I used to see those in the commercials all the time. And um, I didn't know anybody who owned one. I mean, I remember I like him. Oh, I really? Did. Yeah. So uh, one of my mates uh, had a Game Boy camera and uh, we, had, we had a bit of fun with it, really. And uh, also we had the Game Boy printer as well. So basically we were just taking photos of each other and then just like, kind of like goofing them up. And then uh, they basically the uh, the Game Boy camera was effectively kind of like this little ball like it, on top of this game con game cartridge. You popped it in and you could uh, twist it around and stuff like that, but uh, at least the one that we had. And I think some of the earlier designs, I think, didn't have like the twistable camera on it, so I think they basically were just kind of fixed in place. So the annoying thing is, is that if you wanted to play, let's say you wanted to, well, we'll get onto one of the consoles in a minute, but uh, if you wanted to, like, uh, you know, you couldn't take like a photo of yourself, I think you had to like take a photo of, uh, I think you had to like turn this, the Game Boy around, I should say, kind of like, give, you know, just be lucky that you managed to take a photo of yourself. But uh, the yeah, some of the early ones uh, did not have the twistable head on it. Then they started releasing ones with the twistable heads on them, 
And so then you could twist it around and like take pictures wherever you needed to take a picture of. But uh, um, so um, yeah, they were they were a little bit of fun for like you know just uh, you know maybe like uh, you know half an hour or so. But uh, you know the novelty of them eventually did kind of like wear off a little bit. And so you know you had. Um, uh, so you could like play them uh, on like the Super Nintendo, or you could like uh, dare, dare I say I've never actually t- tried to actually put a Game Boy uh, camera uh, thing into a Game Boy player on for the GameCube. But I'll, I'll move on to like all those in, in, in a minute. But uh, yeah, so the Game Boy camera was a little bit of fun, and also the prints of that so you could get with it. Um, basically, what it was is it was just basically you know like uh, those uh, receipt uh, printers that you get in uh, cash machines. Yeah, uh, I remember yeah, those. In the uh, electronic points of sale machines. Yeah, basically it was just that. So it would burn. It, you get like a roll of uh, of paper. You'd uh, which you'd get it for uh, like a particular. Uh, uh, you know, you would you would get in like for these machines, and you pop it in there, and it would burn the uh, the, the 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 image onto the paper, and then you could uh, you could you could take it off. I think you could also uh, get like uh, sticky sticky labels for it, like a roll of like. Uh, sticky label for it as well but besides that like uh, i think nowadays i think the only thing you can really get for it is basically the receipt rolls they can get for mm-hmm. for the game boy printer and uh, then there was uh, the super game boy that uh, came out for the super nintendo and so if you wanted to play your game boy games on your tv you you bought a super nintendo you pop the con- cartridge into actual the the, uh, the uh, console adapter itself and you popped it into the uh, top of the super nintendo and then you could play your game boy games through that and uh, so that accepted both the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color cartridges. Yeah, that was that was actually that was actually one of my favorite um, accessories for the Game Boy for sure because um, I did know one person who owned that, and you know we used to, we used to plug in like Pokemon into the Super Game Boy, and it had like this little cool little screen there, and um, you got to be able to you know see you know, the, the games in kind of color when we were, like, accustomed to seeing it in black and white. Well, I mean, you know, uh, for some people, like, I already owned the Game Boy Color at that point, but you know, in a bigger screen, though, like, that, like, kind of blew my mind at the time. And, you know, I think I even saw somebody, you know, um, even, like, playing the surfing game when they had a Nintendo 64. Um, you know, that was, like, one of the very few things of Nintendo 64 that I had memories of because I never owned the console myself. I had a PlayStation. So um, that was actually, um, you know, like, a massive um, memory to me as well. I also saw the fact that you could be able to, like, customize your um, your screen and you could be able to, like, put any color or any drawings that you wanted and people, like, fooled around with it, kind of similar to, like, what they would do in Mario Paint. And yeah, I think that that's, um, you know, it's definitely like a novelty and that's something that we would have like with the Game Boy Advance when they, um, you know, had the Game Boy player into the GameCube. And then eventually we had like, you know, games that we can download on like virtual consoles like the Wii, Wii U and then the Switch and even the 3DS when, you know, they, you got to play the handhelds. That's where a lot of the jarring thing I think about. I mean, not, not necessarily jarring. I think the most kind of like epic thing I think about the game, but the Super Game Boy was the fact that you put it in there, you turn it on and like, you know, you uh, was hearing it through your TV and you were seeing and you're like you're looking there thinking this is what it's supposed to sound like if it's not on your Game Boy. Like, you know, mm-hmm. it's like it was uh, it was a quite a uh, quite a, sh- a shattering experience, really, because it was like it kind of really did amp up the epicness of uh, your Game Boy games at the time. And uh, no doubt we're going to have that probably experience when uh, uh, when Link, Link, Link's, Link's Awakening uh, gets uh, remastered for the Nintendo Switch. And uh, so I think uh, the fact that yeah, it's, it's going to be orchestral for sure. Exactly. Uh, absolutely. It's going to be. And so, you know, it's like, it was kind of like uh, something a bit like that for us a little bit, except uh, obviously it's uh, obviously going to be, you know, tuned up to a little, only by a little man, but it's still, it was still an epic thing to watch. And uh, then eventually, you know, just before you thought Game Boy couldn't get any more, you know, uh, epic after that, they then came out with a Game Boy Player, uh, which uh, gave you the ability to kind of like, uh, uh, you know, play your Game Boy games on that and use the GameCube controller, which uh, I still think to this day, I think is still like one of the best... Uh, controllers out there yeah for sure i think so like the the, the gamecube hori controller where you could be able to play um game boy games with uh a snes like controller and it was like very rare 
uh, it was released in Japan, but you know, the only way you can be able to get it online was like to go to like to this particular website, but I don't think the website even exists anymore. So yeah, I mean, it was kind of like a novelty of having something akin to like a Super Nintendo controller to play classic Game Boy games like that until eventually we got in the, um, the uh the nintendo switch and then we had like the snes controllers and it's actually kind of funny that you were mentioning this because i i did live and wired with um decker shadow and that long hair creepy guy yesterday we were talking about the prototype of the nintendo 64 and the analog stick that he used was like um a, a more rounder analog stick as opposed to like using the octagonal thing that was in the way and it was like that for the gamecube it was like that for the um the wii and um and you know it, it it just made it like more jerky as opposed to like making it really smooth because i mean the playstation and the dreamcast had the smooth analog control so that kind of made you wonder why the nintendo 64 didn't have that and apparently at one point well, they didn't wait, i, I kind of wonder that as well because you know do you remember the here's the thing about this i can i've probably thrown out probably like three nintendo 64 controllers purely for the same reason is that the uh, joystick you know once it gets a lot of use you know it actually you know the plastic inside is actually grinding so that's the reason why you see a lot of dust you know, that uh, comes in between, you know, the, the gaps of it. And it's actually the uh, the actual mechanisms actually grinding amongst one another. And when they grind too far, eventually the controllers just break and then they can't uh, move anymore. So, mm -hmm. like, uh, so unfortunately, well, I mean, you could say that, uh, I mean, maybe it was probably the fact that Nintendo 64 probably saw, Nintendo probably saw it as a, as a cheaper alternative to those uh uh, to those sticks, but uh, I mean, unfortunately, by cheaping out on that, unfortunately, they've kind of like ruined the last ability of uh, Nintendo 64 uh, controllers, pretty much. Yeah. So it's it's going to get to the point where I think uh, you know a lot of Nintendo 64 games we probably won't be playing on Nintendo 64 anymore. We'll probably end up playing them on the game on the, a GameCube controller or like a like a classic controller. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. And uh, when the Nintendo 64 Classic comes out, yes, I said when, not if, because we know what's going to happen. When the Nintendo 64 Classic comes out, I hope that they do fix this problem because otherwise then people are going to be clamoring to get, um, you know, N Nintendo 64 uh, Classic uh, ha um, controllers and then, you know, we're going to go through the same problems all over again. I don't know, like, uh, I think given the fact that they, they're kind of like focusing on miniaturization, I think on that, it wouldn't surprise me a little bit if they decide, you know what, we'll bring out the N64 Classic, but we're going to bring out like more workable controllers for it. Yeah, I hope they do one based on the prototype, because from what I've seen in the pictures, it looks really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, for the most part, I don't really have any more to talk about other than, you know, talking about some of your, you know, favorite games, which I was uh, alluding to earlier. So uh, do you want to share any? Well, Metroid Fusion, I think, was probably my best GBA uh, game. That's one of my favorite ones. Like, you know, the good grief, the, the creepiness of that, of, uh, of, of Samus's armor, kind of like taking to life and walking around and like, you know, it's, it's the very thing that can like, you know, absolutely obliterate you if you alarm it. Like, uh, you know, it was, uh, that was a pretty creepy game to be, be playing because you're wondering when you're going to come uh, face to face with it. And uh, so um, that was uh, one part of it. And uh, then um, some of the other, my favorite Game Boy games, I mean, you know, Super Mario Land, Zelda, you know, was a Link's Awakening and even Tetris, you know, some of the classics, you know, mm -hmm. they, those are still some of my favorite ones. Um, probably my least favorites will probably have to be Donkey Kong Land because after playing Donkey Kong Country and seeing how epic that game was, to kind of like have it on the super on on the Game Boy, you know, like uh, yeah, it probably would be good to like have it on the go. I just didn't feel I just looked at it and thought it kind of wasn't my thing. You know, they should have probably just kind of developed like its own game. You know, so uh, yeah, that's that that's completely probably, fair. Yeah, so that was kind of like maybe probably my least probably favorite probably um in a Game Boy game. So, uh, and, uh, you know, like, uh, the Metroid games were good. Uh, most of the Mario games were good. And, uh, you know, I think uh, there were some, definitely some good, some good classic games in there. And uh, I definitely urge anyone to, uh, cause, you know, the one thing I will say about this, like, uh, some of the top tens that I see uh, online, like, uh, I can't really disagree with them because, uh, you know, some of the games that they talk about on there are actually pretty good. And so, and uh, now that the I've had a chance to kind of, like, um, you know, have, have, a, have a further look on... Uh, I've been to like uh, conventions and stuff, so they always have like uh, games on display, and so I get a chance to, like any game I've never actually ever get to play before, I actually get to uh, kind of like experience now, and uh, yeah, I can now play them and like say, oh hey, I can I can see what you mean by uh, some of the uh, 
some of the games that you uh, talk about. So, you know, I think uh, the Game Boy, while it does exist, it exists now in the legacy of 3DS and uh, 2DS. I mean, like uh, it was, a, it was a hell of a console to, uh, to to for Nintendo to do, and I don't think we'll ever see anything like that again. I don't think, because I think you know, in handheld games now, I think will either be kind of built into our phones, or they will just kind of like just be like, uh, uh, you know, they'll have like, you know, or Nintendo will basically just do it. You know, like uh, I think it will either have to have the name notoriety, or it will basically just have to be, you know, kind of built into your phone. So, uh, I think, yeah, yeah. Phenomenon, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think we'll basically be a phenomenon that, um, we'll be talking about, I think, for the next several decades. And I don't think we'll ever see again, to be honest. Yeah. And also, another thing that I want to mention is that, um, you know, how do you feel about the music in like Game Boy games? Because a lot of people, I guess, you know, for a lot of people, it's like an acquired taste. It's like for specific people who really grew up with it. It's like, um, you know, they really like the 8-bit chip tunes and they kind of understand the limitations of what the Game Boy could provide in terms of music. Like, you know, similar to like a Game Boy Advance. I mean, it wasn't like that that really good at like producing compilations of music compared to like um, something you would see in an NES or a super NES or in Nintendo 64. So mm. I guess depending on what game it is, you know, it would like deliver some amazing songs and, you know, sometimes you kind of would like to see a remastered or, or orchestrated version of those songs. Well, keep in mind, like, you know, the, the, uh, the original technical specifications, it was basically a two pulse wave generator with one PCM four bit wave sample. So, you know, it, it had massive limitations in regards to, like, uh, you know, and also some of that, it only had, like, one noise generator on it. So, like, uh, of course, the, while it tried to, you know, while it kind of teased us with, like, you know, a lot of uh, amazing, you know, music and a lot of amazing sounds out of it, obviously, it didn't, you know, the uh, the, the hardware didn't do it justice. But uh, at the time, like, you know, it, I guess it can be kind of like, I guess in a way it can be forgiven. Because you know it was like it was uh, the end of the day. You know, Nintendo wanted to provide entertainment for like as uh, for a cheaper rate as possible. So of course they were going to go with that with that direction. So mm -hmm. uh, I think it was I think it was expected to be honest with you. And uh, you know, and now you know as um, games start getting remade. I mean, obviously we talked about Link's Awakening already going in HD for Nintendo Switch. And the, I think eventually we'll uh, start getting you know uh, more enhanced you know uh, versions of these songs that we all well know, know well enough. So like. Uh, I mean, they're, they're definitely out there somewhere. He's got to Google them. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think that um, there is uh, a certain appeal to um, you know listening to like you know like music from an older generation of gaming. You know because they had to work with so little, they were able to craft something so much. And this is probably an unpopular opinion, but even though that I really do like Pokemon uh, Fire Red and Leaf Green, the, the games are phenomenal. Uh, especially for what you know, you know, bringing in um, you know Pokemon Red and Blue for a new generation, but I wasn't really too keen on the music of that one. I mean, the music is fine, but I just felt like the the eight bit chip tunes for the original Game Boy that Junichi Masuda you know had to do in order for you know like atmosphere or you know um, scale or of the adventure was, I, I feel like I was able to connect with it a little bit more with the old Game Boy than with the Game Boy Advance, but maybe that's just me. Well, I mean, I think, uh, the, at least if you play Metroid Fusion, for me, it did capture the, the best, I think, in regards to that. And to keep this in mind, I think uh, also a Nintendo 3DS, so sorry, Nintendo DS also had uh, somewhat, some limitations in that too. So like, uh, and, you know, mm -hmm. so I think, uh, you know, Nintendo DS just kind of like, you know, had, uh, uh, kind of a, a uh, you know Nintendo 64 kind of like uh, you know um, you know sound you know kind of sound emulation in a way. So I mean like uh, it wasn't gonna. I mean I don't think uh, I think probably the most, if we had to talk about underwhelming uh, you know uh, sound performances, I think out of devices maybe probably the Nintendo DS is probably a bit more underwhelming than they say the Game Boys are. So. Yeah, I guess I guess you could say that. Sure. Yeah, I think that um, overall, you know, the Game Boy left a huge legacy amongst gaming, whether it be for people who followed the NES legacy through and through, or people who their first console was a Game Boy. So uh, yeah, it's um, you know still stood stood the test of time with its of its great games and its portability and just all of the the accessories and all that stuff so um, i think that uh you know even still to this day the game boy will still be remembered mm -hmm. and you know like uh you know definitely talk to your uh you know um if you're of uh 
you know, Generation Z or, uh, you know, whatever you call you know, the younger generation that does not remember, you know, uh, between, you know, 1989 to, uh, you know, uh, all the way up to 2003. Like, you know, uh, definitely ask him about the uh, the, 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 uh, the Game Boy legacy because in the, uh, the, 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 uh, the era of the uh, Game Boy and the Pokemon craze, because, you know, you needed to be there to actually kind of admire basically how big this thing got. And, uh, yeah, you know what? It's actually funny that you mentioned that because I actually saw a react to that video online like many, many years ago. And they were asking a whole bunch of little kids, hey, here's a Game Boy and here's a copy of Tetris. And they didn't know how to put it together. Like they were like struggling to put the batteries in and actually putting in the con the, the cartridge. Some of them even put it upside down and they actually like were touching the screen to make it go as opposed to the buttons that were right in front of them. So I just thought it was like, and then they were just talking about like, you know, where's the color? You know, why does it look so small and all that stuff? And a lot of them just didn't understand the appeal of the Game Boy because they were accustomed to like cell phones. Yeah, like I think, but this is the thing, like, you know, when you're introduced to a technology, like, and, and that's your idea of like your first experience with technology, you're going to, uh, you come to these uh, assumptions that you think that uh, everything else is going to be kind of like the same, like, uh, so, I mean, uh, so of course, you know, all those kids were going to, you know, obviously experience thing they're going to experience the game boy in the same light but it obviously they didn't so well, yeah exactly it's like if it's like if we were kids aaron like uh you know around the early 90s and somebody just gave us an eight track tape like what are we supposed to do with an eight track tape when we were used to cassettes and cds well in a way like i mean if you if you look at uh, cassette decks the same way that i mean the eight tracks were kind of like the same as cassette decks in a way i mean i'm gonna be honest probably the thing that would have confused me this confused the hell out of me would probably be disco vision because like uh, do you, you know yeah disco vision was like you had like this plastic sleeve and then you like you put it into the, the into the into the player and then you waited and then you took the the plastic sleeve out and like it was just like uh, that for me was just kind of like a really bizarre thing like you know like a laser disc I would understand you know CDs I would understand you know anything with like just a simple you know push or insertion something like that things like that disco vision was kind of like I'm really I can really understand why this never caught on you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think that's uh, pretty much it for this uh, episode of Casual Chat. So, Aaron, once again, thank you so much for coming on by. Thank you. So, yeah, please uh, plug and promote your stuff. Oh, yeah. If you want to find me on it's the Arrow Meta Show podcast. If you want to find me, it's arrowmeta.co.uk. Uh, Arrow Meta, so also it's uh, Twitter, it's at Arrow Meta Show. Uh, also, facebook.com forward slash Arrow Meta Show. Arrowmeta.tumblr.com. And also on Instagram at Arrow Meta Show as well. So, uh, yeah. Looking forward to seeing you all there to uh, laugh at uh, my lively things. So, All right. So, yeah, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Let us know in the comments below about your earliest Game Boy memories. Uh, what were your favorite games to play on the go? Did you have any crazy accessories? Um, did you have a Super Game Boy or a Game Boy player or one of those, like, really awful joysticks with huge buttons? Ooh, so are you one of the people who owns the four-way link cable? Oh, God. Please let us know if you actually did own that, because I am so curious. You actually use it when you bought it. <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I want to know. So, that's it, everybody. Hope to see you around soon, and take care. Bye-bye.